We read today from the Gospel of John, the third chapter, verses 14 through 21. And Jesus is speaking. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, Jesus said, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his Son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only Son. This is the basis for judgment. The light came into the world, and people loved darkness more than the light, for their actions are evil. All who do wicked things hate the light and don't come to the light for fear that their actions will be exposed to the light. Whoever does the truth comes to the light so that it can be seen that their actions were done in God. It is not every day that a snake crawls into a gospel text. And I, for one, am glad. Most of us get a little nervous any time a snake shows up, and in today's text, it is certainly a difficult moment. It's difficult first because if we don't know the reference, we're really just bewildered. When Jesus refers to Moses lifting up the snake in the wilderness, our only response might be, say what? But speaking for myself, having more information about Moses and the snake only makes me more uncomfortable. And maybe it's that way for you too. Jesus is referring to a Hebrew Bible story. It's the numbers text that you heard Andrew read just a moment ago. And I'll recap. The people of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, and as they continually did on their 40-year journey, they complained. The text says they spoke against God and Moses, decrying the lack of food and water and accusing Moses and by association God, of bringing them into the wilderness for the purpose of killing them. God's response was to send poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit the people. Many of the Israelites died. And when the Israelites recognize their error and ask for help, Moses, on God's instruction, makes a bronze snake and puts it on a pole. And the story says if a snake bit someone, that person could look at the bronze snake and live. Now, honestly, how do you feel about a story that says God's response to people's impatience and fretfulness is to send poisonous snakes among them? And when Moses, in response to God's command, makes a bronze snake and puts it on a pole for people to look at, isn't that um, a graven image? How does that square with Exodus 20, verse 4? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath. And somehow this graven image has powers that keep the Israelites alive. Now I... I'm seriously uncomfortable. These are our scriptures, and we're reading them out loud on the internet, maybe to someone who is encountering church for the first time. Is that person going to expect me to hold up a bronze serpent in the sanctuary? It's not like we can ignore or dismiss this numbers text because it plays a key role in what Jesus is teaching. And yet it comes from a very distant past. And maybe that past is something we prefer not to look at. We're not the first to have this problem. As far back as the first century, Jewish interpreters also struggled with this Numbers text, which was ancient even to them. And their interpretive solution was to say that the Israelites, in raising their eyes to see the snake, actually looked up toward heaven, and so were cured. The rabbis might have been tempted to skip the text of their past or pretend it didn't exist. 
but instead they brought it into the light, looked the snake in the face, and found meaning in it for their understanding of God. When confronted with a difficult story from the deep, deep past, it can be helpful to ask, well, what did the people who told this story want us to know? Considering that a principal concern of the Hebrew Bible, yea, the entire Bible, is what constitutes right relationship with God, I would venture that in this Numbers text, we are to realize that at this moment, the Israelites are not in that right relationship. Instead of trusting that God desires good for them, the people accuse Moses and, by association, God, of bringing them out to die in the wilderness. God, they claim, clearly did not want them to live. God wanted them to die, to suffer, and then to die. We are to realize that the Israelites are mistaken and that that they have let their mistake turn them in the wrong direction. In their relationship with God, they are missing the mark. They are out of right relationship. Now, please don't take this to mean that in our relationship with God, there's no room for questions. I believe that questioning and even complaining can be part of our faith journey. Questioning is just a way of saying we don't understand what God is up to. And isn't that always going to be the case? Complaining is our way of saying we're unhappy. And we're certainly allowed, even encouraged, to tell God when we're unhappy. I don't want you to go the rest of this day thinking, if I have a moment in which I get a little frustrated because I don't understand what God is up to in my life, I'm going to find a poisonous snake in my bed tonight. The Israelites aren't actually asking questions. Instead, they're presuming to already know the truth about Moses, about God, about their own importance. And it seems that they are letting those bitter, angry, and unexamined presumptions turn them away from God and twist them in on themselves. And maybe that inward twisting explains why they keep failing to get anywhere on their desert journey, why over and over they miss the mark. But what about those snakes? Do we today believe that when we fall out of right relationship with God, God's response is to deliberately send harm among us? While that theology can be found in the early books of the Bible, later books of the Bible, later texts will argue with that theology. And I will say that it is not my personal understanding of how God is for us. If you got bitten by a poisonous snake, as your pastor, I would not encourage you to spend time looking for a reason God sent that snake to bite you. I would encourage you to look around for someone that God sent to help you. But what did the people who told this story want us to know? Think about this. After the snakes arrived, The Israelites went to Moses and said, We've sinned, for we spoke against the Lord and you. In those snakes, they recognized the sin in their speaking. It puts me in mind of the book of James, which makes it clear that your very own tongue can come back to bite you. In those twisty, poisonous, or as the Hebrew text actually says, fiery serpents, the Israelites recognize the sin of their own tongues, and they ask for God's help. Notice, though, that despite their request, God does not take the snakes away. Instead, God sets it up so that any Israelite who gets bitten must look a snake right in the face in order to be healed. Maybe what the people who told this story want us to know is simply this. When we are bitten by our sins, we cannot be healed 
without looking right at them. So it is that this ancient, uncomfortable snake story comes back to haunt us in the words of Jesus. Just as Moses so lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Uncomfortable and so much more is what we need to be when we gaze on our own sins and their result. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is the result of the sins of humankind. And we cannot be healed of those sins without looking right at them. We cannot be healed without gazing fully on all our complicity in all this world's suffering as exemplified by Jesus' crucifixion. If the Israelites recognized the sins of their tongues in the image of fiery serpents, what might we recognize as our sins when we gaze on the suffering, crucified Christ? Anger, hatred, violence, bitter presumptions that twist us away from God's invitation to right relationship with God and each other. Feeling so threatened by that invitation that we destroy the one sent to invite us. We can hardly bear to look. But look we must if we would live. When it comes to things we'd rather not bring into the light, our past contains a lot more than some problematic scriptures. There's a lot of stuff in the past that we would rather not look at. That is true collectively, institutionally, as we see, for example, in our corporate abuse of the earth, in the exploitation of or indifference to the poor, in the reluctance of white America to gaze fully upon our national sin of slavery and the stain of racism that endures because of it. It's true of us individually. Who among us is eager to look straight at the worst thing we have ever done. There is a lot about our past, and indeed our present, that we would rather keep in the darkness. But God brings it into the light and insists that we gaze fully upon the mistakes that we have made in order that we might live. The sight of the crucified Christ drives us not only to recognition of our sins, but to repentance, which opens us to grace, which opens us to full life in God, a life in which we understand that we no longer have to be complicit with sin. By the grace of God, we can make a different choice. And when we nevertheless, again, choose badly, which we will, by the grace of God, we look again and again are restored to life. Let us look then and live. Look and live in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>